It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 251 at block height 665,161 on Friday, January 8th, 2021. What is up, Janine? It's the year of Johnny Mnemonic. Also Mad Max. <laughs> oh. That uh, that has new significance, given uh, some news items. Very possibly. So I what, mean, what we already random... we already have a, a good candidate for a white-haired mob boss. What what I like? I'm trying to think before we get into the stories. Is there anything that we can actually talk about in the world that won't get us kicked off of YouTube? Like, I, I, I can't Julian Assange. <laughs> we can talk about Julian Assange. But he's on the news desk. Like, it's... We, I got... Shit. We can talk about WhatsApp doing the completely predictable thing that we all thought they would do, which is they get owned by Facebook, and then they get owned by Facebook. There we go. There's something. Fuck you, police state. We will banter before getting to the news. Yeah, so for anyone who doesn't know, I mean, I hope none of you use WhatsApp for anything important uh, or at all, <laughs> to be honest. But um, yes, so Facebook owns WhatsApp. Surprise, if you didn't know that. Um, and on February 8th, uh, they have indicated that they are going to change their privacy policy to uh, share your data with Facebook. <laughs> uh, so much for that end-to-end -end encryption, right? Uh, well, to be fair, it's still technically encrypted. They're just going to share everything else about it, like your social network and uh, you know IP address and all that. Um, because, yeah, Newsflash... Encrypting something doesn't mean there's no information. Uh, it Using encryption does not mean going dark. There is still tons of metadata that is useful. Uh, you may have heard the phrase, the very famous phrase, metadata. Uh, we kill people with metadata. Uh, and that is because encryption on its own is not completely foolproof. It entirely depends on the design. They're not all equal. Um, so yes, if you are using WhatsApp which again, I hope you are not, uh, you should move to something else if you do not want Facebook to uh, get all of that. Yep. And I see lots and lots of potential for clear communications over Facebook that get tied to your WhatsApp. Um, and even though nobody can see what you're saying in WhatsApp, I think we're moving in the direction where just certain people associating with each other are, are going to be red flag time. So, yeah. Also a good time to point out that I believe, I, I would have to check, but I think by default, if you signed up to Facebook uh, through a mobile device, and especially if you have a mobile phone number connected to your account, Facebook allows people to search for your Facebook account using your phone number. So anyone who has your phone number, unless you've disabled this, can find your Facebook account. Isn't that wonderful? It's almost like these types of messaging apps shouldn't have anything to do with a phone number. Yeah. I should know, because I only use the ones that don't. Like, did you know that you can use Telegram without using Telegram? I do, because I get people asking me all the time if I have Telegram, and I say no. 
I have Matrix, and you can bridge Matrix to Telegram. But I am not going to make an account with Telegram, because Telegram requires a phone number. Everybody should follow Janine's example. All right. I think, I think it's time to dive into this massive list of things on the news desk. Yes, we should do that. I am hungry. Now I'm hungry. What the hell? That's all your uh-huh. fault. All right. So first up is something Jack Maulers has been hinting at for a couple weeks now, I think. Um, yesterday, he announced the launch of Strike Global, um, which is going to be expanding all the strike infrastructure outside of the United States. And um, yeah, this is a massive whopper of a doozy that... <laughs> um, uh, Let's just say, even given the nature of Strike as a KYC platform, um, I think this is legit one of the biggest things built in this space in years. But um, they they have partnered with Bittrex Global, a big exchange um, that has a lot of international access, and they are going to be expanding to over 200 countries um, long term as they start rolling this out with support for USDT, USDC, the stable coins. They already have actual dollar support, euros, British pounds. Um, I think, um, I, f- I forget the, the name of the Swiss currency. Um, I think it's the franc, right? Yep. Um, supporting that. <clears throat> um, they will be onboarding a million plus Bittrex users onto Strike. Um, are going to be launching the Strike Visa card in the first quarter of 2021 in the U.S. and attempt to launch the card in the European Union and the U.K. by quarter two. So they're going to be starting out um, kind of rolling things out in beta and plugging all of this together. Um, But pretty much, um, yeah, what, what this is is strike setting up lightning infrastructure in all of the jurisdictions they're planning on expanding to um so lightning nodes um hooking things up into um bank accounts or financial services there and um pretty much kicking the swift network in the dick (laughs) um like just point blank um strike global is going after swift And that is the type of thing that this is building out to replace and build on top of Bitcoin. Because with that lightning infrastructure in all these places globally, um, I I know you won't, um, but if you were to get a strike account, Janine, um, I could just snap my finger, send you $1,000, have that converted into euros, and instantly available with no more fees than what strike is passing on from the lightning network which at this time um i believe they're not um and my own thoughts on that is kind of just maybe using investments or profits off of the trading they have to do on the back end to hedge volatility to subsidize that um so yeah um jack has built strike out into a fucking swift competitor on top of bitcoin and that is mind-bogglingly crazy and if that's not crazy enough um one of the places they're opening up the uh the beta for this is el salvador um which actually after a uh a civil war in the 80s um and the economic consequences after that um wound up using the dollar um as their official currency and that kind of creates a lot of problems because their banking infrastructure sucks. Um, El Salvador can't legally print U.S. dollars. Um, so this kind of creates a screwy situation in this country. Um, so how Jack is solving this is um, you remember um, I said that they're supporting USDT and USDC now. Um, rather mm-hmm. than me send money um, 
from my bank account settled over lightning to wind up in someone else's bank account, um, they swap it out into USDT. And the user in El Salvador has a, a credit balance with Strike for USDT. And um, if they really want to, because how things are, are structured in Strike, um, they can seamlessly dump that into physical cash just by going up to a Bitcoin ATM, hitting sell, zapping that over on chain or through Lightning, and pull actual physical cash out of this. So using stable coins like this, um, Strike can actually um, kind of set up endpoints in countries with really shit banking infrastructure as well. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, he is not only setting up something that could potentially just obsolete and destroy Swift for those purposes, but on the end user side, um, using stable coins has figured out a way to have the end user able to plug into things even when their legacy financial infrastructure is total dog shit. So like <laughs> this is fucking crazy. And like, yeah, I mean, this is something that people have been talking about in Bitcoin for literally the entire time I have been in this space is Bitcoin things built on Bitcoin effectively offering an alternative or a way to route around networks like Swift and Jack Maulers just actually fucking built it <laughs> like th this is crazy. Yep. So, yeah, um, I think lightning and stuff built on top of that is really hitting the fever pitch point of this is bonkers and this is going to start winding up in a lot of people's hands and actually getting used. Yeah, I mean, the, if you're going to have a bank account of any sort, this sounds like one of the most amazing things to use it with. So, um and also, I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, it's useful for people who don't even care much about Bitcoin. So I think, you know, it's going to be, it, it's good. I mean, it almost makes me scared because like, I know he's, you know, partnering with Visa and such, but I'm worried about like, he, if he's going to be kicking this much ass and challenging a lot of the existing players in that space if there's going to be some sort of pushback from them i wouldn't i would be surprised if there wasn't well i'm kind of you know trying to think about what form that could take aside from some country somewhere going we don't want this um which is just going to screw them and their own citizens i mean bitcoin is is clear that's legal um, you know, previous OCC rulings, um, have clarified it's legal for financial institutions to interact with those things. Um, you know, even the most recent, um, declaration we'll get into in a little bit has specifically cleared stable coins as something, you know, financial entities are allowed to use. So, I mean, I, <laughs> from where I see, um, he is pretty compliant and armchair lawyering, um, I, I, I'm kind of hard pressed to see where somebody could actually go at him. Well, it, it's you, you know very well, it's not a matter of whether there actually is anywhere to go at him. <laughs> the, the, there are people who will do so despite that. Yeah, but like, how because successful they have all the will money. they be? Well, that is the question. Uh, this is going to be a fight. Um, this is going to be a very interesting fight. But uh, I can definitely see it catching on because I've seen a bunch of people open uh, strike accounts in the last couple of days. I mean, you know, just think think back, like how long people have been saying, you know, one day people will be using Bitcoin and not even have the foggiest clue they are. Um, I think we're almost there. 
Yeah, Freds, I don't think, I mean, I'm not interested in solving a democracy crisis. I'm an anarchist. <laughs> what? Yeah. Here's how we solve it. We delete it. Do not engage in censorship. But yeah, I mean, Jack Mauler's, um however things go uh in the end is a ballsy ass motherfucker and this is a crazy thing to see starting to roll out i'll just be over here in my privacy corner <laughs> that's okay very though, because, sad me because it talks lightning natively so you can you can stay in that corner and, and still you know talk money at people yeah and that I mean, yeah, so that's the argument that I saw, uh, I think it was 6102 making, and initially when I saw that thread, I thought he was trolling, or he, he, she, they, I thought they were trolling, uh, because it's, it really surprised me that they were on board, but the argument did make sense from that point of view, so I, I, I've concluded that it's probably not a troll. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, that's always been like my favorite part about strike is being a KYC custodial app. Like it doesn't force people to like go into that walled garden to interact with it. Like someone from strike can deal with somebody on a native lightning node and vice versa. And there is zero friction there. What else is happening frictionlessly over lightning? So uh, in the interest of how massive the news desk is, I'm just going to go through these quickly. Um, but uh, Bitfinex, um, through their um, Bitfinex terminal app, um, is now selling metered historical order book data um, over the Lightning Network um, for Tether tokens or for their... Um, exchange token, whatever the hell that's called these days. Um, and pretty much by, I think it is hourly um, time windows during which they can download historical data that they've paid for. So, um, you know, th th this is cool just in the sense of, you know, metered buying digital data uh, for Lightning Network. And while a lot of people listening probably won't care about this. Um, market data is very important for traders, um, especially trying to go back and back test um, hypothesis on different indicators and magic meme lines that traders make decisions on. So this is a really cool thing um, in terms of just making more information available for that and you know actually monetizing it on Bit the next end. And Another cool thing in terms of streaming um, or lightning payments for digital things, um, LN Bits, a, a kind of similar to the BTC Pay LN Bank Stack um, we just had Kooks and uh, Dennis Raymond on for, kind of just an account system that sits on top of a lightning node, um, built out a new extension um, so that you can hook your Cloudflare um, DNS um, API token into LN bits, which is hooked up to your lightning node and actually sell subdomains on um, domains that you own for lightning. Um, so we, uh, aside from Jack's earth shattering um, Swift competitor um, is really two cool use cases of just really buying small digital goods for micropayments over lightning. So yeah, just all around. Um, <laughs> I feel like this year is going to be the year that lightning really starts coming into its strides. Like I'm already trying to think of like what kind of applications or tools um, you could build out based on just like buying small subdomains on a, a main domain. I, I have a hunch there is some way to hack together, you know, more... Um, private, less company-oriented social media namespaces or things like that. Mm -hmm. All right. 
positive chunk of lightning stuff is done. Time for sadness. Yes. So on December 30th, the U.S. Department of Treasury released the details of an enforcement action against BitGo, and the notice says that BitGo, quote, has agreed to remit $98,830 to settle its potential civil liability for 183 apparent violations of multiple sanctions programs, the apparent violations in the document. As a result of deficiencies related to BitGo's sanctions compliance procedures, BitGo failed to prevent persons apparently located in the Crimea region of Ukraine, Cuba, Iran, Sudan, and Syria from using its non-custodial secure digital wallet management service. BitGo had reason to know that these users were located in sanctioned jurisdictions based on internet protocol address data associated with devices used to log in to the BitGo platform. At the time of the transactions, however, BitGo failed to implement controls designed to prevent such users from accessing its services. OFAC determined that BitGo did not voluntarily self-disclose the apparent violations and that the apparent violations constitute a non-egregious case. Hmm. So before I continue, I would just like to point out BitGo did not self-report this. Uh, So how exactly did OFAC and or the U.S. Department of Treasury find out? Chain uh, analytics. Very Something good else, because they don't. I, as far as I could, I didn't completely finish reading the document, but I did not see where they disclosed how they even discovered this in the first place. So, hmm, that's a good question. Because you would have to be snooping between BitGo and customers on a network level if that was not disclosed to find something like that. Maybe chain analytics, but like, how would that? Yeah, well, I, mean, I mean, maybe they found chain analytics that went back to a tainted place and then kind of went knock knock. Like, what the hell is that? So I, my best guess would be chain analytics because remember that tweet from uh, what's his name starts with a Z. We've uh, uh, you did the pain in with him, oh, and I follow him on Twitter. Up. Yeah. Remember his tweet saying that Bitcoin originating from uh, exchanges in Iran that was being sent to wallets and or exchanges in the U.S. was getting blocked because chain analytics were flagging it? Mm -hmm. That was pretty recent, so I would not be surprised if that was the reason. Anyway, so further in the document says this action emphasizes that the OFAC sanctions compliance obligations apply to all U.S. persons, including those involved in providing digital currency services. As part of a risk-based approach, OFAC encourages companies that provide digital currency services to implement sanctions compliance controls commensurate with their risk profile. So more detail about um, BitGo and what they have done as a result of this. It says BitGo tracked its users' IP addresses for security purposes related to account logins. BitGo, however, did not use this IP address information for sanctions compliance purposes. As a result, users located in Crimea, Cuba, Iran, Sudan, and Syria. Oh, you left out New York City there. Where'd that go? Uh, (laughs) We're we're able to create and use digital currency wallets on BitGo's platform and engage in digital currency transactions. Despite BitGo's ability to identify the location of these users, prior to April 2018, BitGo allowed individual users of its secure wallet management service to open an account providing only a name and email address. In April 2018, BitGo amended its practices to require all new account holders to also verify the country in which they are located, but BitGo generally relied on each user's attestation regarding their location and did not perform additional verification or diligence on the location of its users. However, after learning of the apparent violations in January 2020, BitGo implemented an OFAC sanctions compliance policy and undertook significant remedial measures as discussed further below, which I will read off. Alrighty, so as listed, the changes include uh, BitGo implemented a new OFAC policy, as was already stated, that includes a detailed overview of OFAC and relevant sanctions law, the appointment of a compliance officer uh, specifically responsible for implementing and providing guidance and interpretation, blah, 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 IP address blocking, as well as email-related restrictions. 
whatever that means, for sanctioned jurisdictions, periodic batch screening, record-keeping procedures for all financial records and documentation related to sanctions compliance, a review where appropriate um, to update and user agreements to ensure that customers are aware of and comply with U.S. sanctions, a review of screening configuration criteria on a periodic basis, um, BICO screens all accounts, including hot wallet accounts against OFAC's specifically designated nationals and blocked persons list, including blocked cryptocurrency wallet addresses identified by OFAC. BitGo has also conducted a retroactive batch screen of all users. BitGo routinely reviews its OFAC policy and updates its procedures as appropriate, and BitGo employees are required to certify that they have reviewed and understood BitGo's OFAC policy and are required to attend training programs as appropriate. Oh my god. Okay, well, the reason I bring this up, because uh, coincidentally, I don't know if you saw Shinobi, but um, there was that whole kerfuffle with uh, GitHub not allowing people from Iran to use GitHub, like many, many, many I months ago. I did not, ago. actually. That's fucked up. Oh, you don't remember it? We talked about it on the show, or maybe I'm mis-summarizing it or something. Um, well, my memory is not working. <laughs> Well, let's take a brief break and I will go find it. One second. Okay, I was not able to find the uh, time that we talked about on the show, but <gasps> this will give a summary. So I, I can't remember how long ago it was. I know it was in the last two years, I think. Um, oh yeah, 2019, so they summarized it in the post. Um, but yeah, so 2019, there was a controversy because GitHub was restricting access for... Um, people who are in Iran or Iranian from using GitHub um, due to, as they said, U.S. sanctions laws. And so the reason that this thing with BitGo is interesting um, is because actually on January 6th, just a few days ago, GitHub said that they are not doing that anymore. They, uh, Nate Friedman, who I think is the CEO, wrote, all developers should be free to use GitHub no matter where they live. At the same time, GitHub respects and abides by U.S. law, which means government sanctions have limited our ability to provide developers in some countries the full range of GitHub services. Today we are announcing a breakthrough. We have security license from the U.S. government to offer GitHub to developers in Iran. This includes all services for individuals and organizations, private and public, free and paid. So what happened here? The U.S. has long imposed broad sanctions on multiple countries, including Iran. These sanctions prohibit any U.S. company from doing business with anyone in a sanctioned country. These sanctions can also apply to non-U.S. companies whose activities directly or indirectly involve the U.S., including merely having payments that flow through U.S. banks or payment mechanisms like Visa. And so in 2019, GitHub implemented access restrictions for developers in Iran and several other countries to comply with U.S. sanctions laws. At the same time, in keeping with our goal of making GitHub available to anyone, we also immediately took two actions. First, we complied with the sanctions. We went to great lengths to keep as much of GitHub as avail available to as many developers as possible under U.S. sanctions laws, making public repos available even san in sanctioned countries. One second while I scroll. And separately, uh, we took our case to the Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC, part of the U.S. Treasury Department, and began a lengthy and intensive process of advocating for broad and open access to GitHub and sanctioned countries. Over the course of two years, we were able to demonstrate how a developer use of GitHub advances human progress, international communication, and the enduring U.S. foreign policy of promoting free speech and the free flow of information. We are grateful to OFAC for the engagement which has led to this great result for developers. We are in the process of rolling back all restrictions on developers in Iran and reinstating full access to affected accounts. For developer, yeah, developers who have questions or need help with their accounts, please visit the help page. We still have more work to do. We want every developer to be able to collaborate on GitHub, and we are working with the U.S. government to secure similar licenses for developers in Crimea and Syria as well. Stay tuned. So, yes, completely different result here. <laughs> I I feel like this thing with BitGo opens up a giant can of worms and potential problems. I mean, like if if you can't even just be a effectively a 2FA security factor for a non-custodial thing, like that's violating sanctions. How, really, where does this go? Like that that's escrows obviously. Um, you know, 2FA wallets like BitGo or Casa, 
like I, I'm assuming this would apply to Casa too, Unchained Capital, all of these, you know, tools or services that are supposed to help people with security of their coins. Like this is not allowed in sanctions. Like w are, are you allowed to use a VPN now when you connect to this for your own privacy or Tor? Is, is that, are both of those going to be banned too now? Like th this just seems really trying to push the line as far as they can towards just non-custodial like software where a user can do whatever the hell they want no matter what the service provider does even that is, is no no and that that's just a, a really weird bifurcation there because really where's the specialization where's the experience in building tools like that outside of the west or at least you know what what would be called first world countries um I, I'm not aware of anything like that. So is that whole part of the world cut off from any tools that could help them secure their money better, even though there's nothing that provider can do except that? So I would have to I would have to read the document again and completely because I don't know if they went into this, but it, in the portion that I read, which is pretty significant, they didn't actually say, whether like they didn't say specifically that bitgo was responsible because they were even though the wallet was non-custodial they were still hosting the infrastructure and there was no other way to use bitgo's wallet without using their infrastructure so maybe that's the argument uh i didn't see whether the argument was specifically that because they have a they have you know it's a multi-signature wallet that that therefore um, or a signing key, whatever it is, um, that that is what makes them responsible. I didn't see that. I hope that is the case because I can, I mean, I mean, I don't hope for any of this. I, I, I think this is all dumb, but like, it would be a lot worse if the, if the sanction is going to apply to anyone who just provides the infrastructure, even if the wallet is non-custodial, because that, that would be bad um it's also not clear that if bitgo had either not been collecting the ip address information like they didn't have that and so they could the, the us government couldn't come to them and say well you clearly knew that your services were being accessed from these countries or maybe they didn't know it consciously but they had the data because their infrastructure was collecting it um that is also not clear either so i would have to read more into that but any which way you look at it, um, this sucks because these these restrictions are not going to stop money laundering. They're not going to stop, like, no fucking dictator in Iran is going to be using BitGo, and if they are, like, <laughs> wrong choice. Um, but, yeah, at the end of the day, this is going to just hurt regular people in Iran, regular citizens who want to escape the currency controls that are being imposed on them now basically by the world because of the US because everyone's afraid of the US um, and want to escape, you know, their own currency issues. So this is not going to solve anything. If, if this is more about the infrastructure on the back end and not actually holding a key in anything, then wouldn't this apply to pretty much any light wallet that's hard coded to somebody else's back end yeah that that would effectively be what would happen uh so i would i would probably have to revisit this in the next show because that would be really bad but i assume that if that was the case more people would be freaking out but maybe i'm wrong maybe everyone is okay with just updating their infrastructure to block IP ad IP addresses from specific countries, in which case, um, yeah, do that. But have you heard of something called Tor? And if your infrastructure doesn't allow you to use Tor, well, it's not very interesting to me anyway. So, Yeah, this, yeah, we probably should touch on this again next week because that is a lot of open questions there. <sighs> well, shit. That just got really depressing, potentially. 
Well, hey, the uh, the consequence of it should be you should definitely allow use Tor because then you have plausible deniability at the very least. I mean, I don't know if that completely solves your problem, but would be a good idea in general. <laughs> Although I don't know whether, uh, I don't know, these, these kinds of services are punk enough for that. If that really is how this settles out, then that sounds like a huge argument to make neutrino filter serving a uh, a default service for nodes. Ah, oh, boy. All right. Want to get I mean, into the OCC? Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming it wouldn't go that far because then... I mean, if that's the case, then you could argue, like, they would have to argue that now nodes on the Bitcoin network, if they if they relay transactions from Iran and they have any reason to believe that it was ever originating from Iran, then they have to not relay it. Like, that's just, I don't, <laughs> that's just not realistic. So I'm assuming it must, I mean, at the very least, it must be because of the key thing, but... I don't know. This government is insane, as we will see in these next few stories, so who knows. Yep. Well, to mosey along into the next one, um, pretty much just a uh, quick clarification uh, from the OCC that banks are in fact cleared to use um, nodes that validate and relay information on networks, and specifically um to use stable coins on any networks that they operate a node for um as an alternative way to process or settle payments um of course with the caveat that um, you are a financial institution or a bank um so you have to comply with all of the kyc aml issues and this goes specifically to the point of um requiring the ability to identify um, anyone using our favorite word, unhosted wallets on a network interacting with that stable coin. Um, and pretty much just the entire rationale is, you know, un under all the, the laws and regulations banks operate under, um, they're pretty much an intermediary, a custodian, a payment facilitator. And all of this legislation has always been interpreted as allowing banks to engage in the use of new or um, experimental technology um, to find new, more efficient ways to facilitate those functions as banks. And that stable coins, um, you know, kind of fall into that category of something new, just like traveler's checks used to be, credit cards, debit cards, um, et cetera. So, um, yeah, banks can settle things and use stable coins. And the way I'm reading this is effectively the U.S.'s response to China's push um, and a lot of their recent uh, pilot programs to actually start putting out their, their own central bank digital currency. Um, so pretty much, I think, uh, the odds of the U.S., doing a CBDC like that anytime soon are pretty much null and um, clearing banks to use existing stable coins. Um, it's probably their counter move to China here rather than building our own CBDC. Mm -hmm. Down with fiat, long live blockchains. Down with cryptocurrency, long live fiat on blockchains. Well, I think uh, Bob McElrath referred to them as, oh, I can't remember the term now. I think I mentioned it several times, and now I can't remember. One second. I found it. So uh, 2018, he said, let's stop. Let's all agree to stop calling it stablecoin and start calling it a fully collateralized inflationary shitcoin peg. He also suggested crypto dollar ETFs, but I I would rather go with fully collateralized and collateralized inflationary shitcoin peg. Oh, Bob. 
such beautiful poetic words. All righty. So I think it is time to talk about Finn's son. Again, and twice. So, uh, FinCEN recently issued a notice titled Report of Foreign Bank and Financial Accounts, uh, FBAR, Filing Requirement for Virtual Currency. And it says, currently the report of foreign bank and financial accounts, also known as FBAR, because fuck, fuck this bar, I guess. <laughs> Uh, regulations do not define a foreign bank account holding virtual currency as a type of reportable account. Um, for that reason, at this time, a foreign account holding virtual currency is not reportable on the FBAR unless it is a reportable account under uh, insert numbers and letters <laughs> because it holds reportable assets besides virtual currency. However, FinCEN intends to propose and amend the regulations implementing the Bank Secrecy Act uh, regarding reports of foreign financial accounts to include virtual currency as a type of reportable account under insert numbers and letters. Um, so this first, uh, I, I didn't see the notice. It first came to my attention when Kristen Bagano tweeted on December 31st that FinCEN sent out a notice that is revising rules so U.S. persons with foreign accounts holding crypto must report, as is the case with securities and currencies, to FinCEN's FBAR website if the amount exceeds 10k. Unclear, unhosted, hosted aggregation. This is going to be interesting. And I still, to this day, I have not, I found more information about, um, like a lot of the, the reports I saw on this were about FBAR and what, like, what makes you, um, what like what triggers you to be uh required to make reports and the just for anyone who doesn't know this the 10k amount is so if you have whether it's one single foreign account or multiple foreign accounts if the amount that goes through that account in a calendar year exceeds 10k then you have to file with fbar if it's under that they as far as i know you don't have to a lot of if you've ever gone outside the United States as an American person, uh, a lot of banks will do things to make you compliant with FBAR just upon signing up, no matter what amount of money you put in. Um, probably over compliance, I would guess. But anyway, um, I still have not found anything that specifically clarifies that this applies only to custodial accounts. But Shinobi, you think that is the case? I have not found that um if it is the case then yeah. that's kind of predictable because yeah if you have a custodial account that kind of is like a bank account just because you have crypto in it meh um because if that was not the case holy shit that would be really awful and but i assume that because no one else is freaking out about this that's probably what it means uh the big question though still uh that i have not seen answered is um like, is the value of the cryptocurrency at the time it goes into the bank account the value that is, like, you're taking into consideration when you make the decision of whether to file with FBAR or not? Or is it, like, if, like, if the, like, if someone starts out with, I don't know, $500 of Bitcoin or something and the price goes insanely high, do they have to report it at the point that, like, if it goes over 10 k like um yeah I, these, I don't. these things are generally like if at any time in the year um period like the amount exceeds that then you have to file well boys and girls that is a very good reason to not hodl at a custodial account <laughs> mm -hmm. there is though one silver lining to this um i think fuck is it Okay, I completely forget what the other requirement is, but there is another requirement for foreign accounts besides the FBAR. And um, the threshold for that, I think, is 50,000 at any point during the year or um, like at, at any one time if that account has 50K or more. Um, or if at the end of the years it has, yeah, FATCA, that's it. Um, or if it exceeds 75k at the end of the year, um, you also have to file a bunch of stuff. But 
what this F bar thing um, or requirement kind of clarifies is there was never a requirement to file F bar if all you had on the um, custodial account outside of the US was cryptocurrency. So if you did not also, um, you know, fall over the thresholds for FATCA and have to file that, um, any trader who has had balances on foreign exchanges um, trading before um, this clarification, there was at no point in time a requirement to file FBAR for that as long as it was just cryptocurrencies. Um, and if you did not meet the FATCA requirements, um, you would not have to file for that either. So pretty much anybody who is not throwing around like, you know, 100K plus all over the place um, on a constant basis on foreign exchanges, um, there was no requirement to declare that. So anybody kind of worrying about um, that and whether they were compliant with um, these requirements, um, as long as you were clear under FATCA, you should be clear under FBAR as well. And there were no requirements to do anything if you didn't. But good luck getting your money back if you had any consequences that you didn't deserve before this. Yep. All right, should I continue with the FinCell news? As soon as I say, a fuck are you, FinCell? All right, so at the start of episode 249, we talked about some proposed rulemaking from FinCell at the very end of... 2020, uh, because on December 18th, Director Kenneth Blanco filed a notice to require banks and money services businesses to submit reports, keep records, and verify the identity of customers in relation to transactions involving convertible virtual currency or digital assets with legal tender status, blah, 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 if it is valued above the equivalent of $3,000. This is known as KYCC, know your customers, customer, or I, I almost said the other C word that I probably... <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Anyway, uh, yeah, so this is just rehashing. The document notes that they would be limiting the notice and comment period. This is from my newsletter because I don't know if anyone remembers that we talked about this, but um, the comment period was limited to 15 days uh, because the proposal involved foreign affairs functions of the United States um, and there must not be undue delay. Well, since then, um, first of all, there was a hilarious uh, kind of game going on in this in the background where uh, the final date uh, for submitting comments was actually incorrect. It was not even 15 days minimum. Um, so that was a bit shitty of the government to do, like not only really cover it really cutting short the time period but also getting the fucking time period wrong good for them they must be excellent at math uh which is exactly why we should give them more data i guess um well many individuals and businesses in the space have decided to work during the past holiday break and make their opinions heard uh including chain analysis regulatory team who said that efforts to improve enforcement should be driven by what would actually improve the effectiveness of the system, not by adding check uh, box checking and compliance requirements. That's a, uh, I feel like that's a thing where they should take their own advice, if you know what I mean. But uh, they also said the proposed requirements go beyond the level of reporting and verification that exists in traditional financial services. The collection of large amounts, large amounts of personal data on citizens transacting normally will not further the fight against illicit proceeds as demonstrated by the use of unhosted wallets. It places an undue burden on regulators and the industry to collect and manage this data when there are more urgent vulnerabilities in cryptocurrencies which can be addressed using the power and transparency of the blockchain. Woo! If that's a subtle plug to use their service anyway. Uh, there was also a letter sent to Mnuchin signed by, uh, well, initially it was signed by like three congressmen, then it became eight, and then it became nine, including Tulsi Gabbard, which I was not actually expecting because I don't remember her ever saying anything about Bitcoin. So, That's my girl. Yeah, too bad she like uh, kind of bent the knee to Biden when she did not get a nomination. 
Anyway, in addition to Coin Center, there was commentary from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which some people might be surprised by because they're not, uh, in general, too interested in Bitcoin or friendly to it, but they have been doing a lot of stuff recently to oppose um, the lack of transparency in fintech apps and services in general, and Coinbase especially fell under that, and so that's been nice to see. Um, also, the uh, Fight for the Future Foundation, which actually set up its own comment submission system to send to FinCEN, Kraken, Square, and many others. Um, another funny, well, not not really funny detail about this whole process is that um, for some reason that I still don't have the answer to, <laughs> and I'm starting to laugh already just thinking about this, but... The, uh, the website that you had to use to submit your comments, it would um, stop working <laughs> on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> and you would have to go to a different website uh, that I believe was beta.regulations.gov or something along those lines. You, you went to a beta version <laughs> of the website. I, I feel that's like a great, like, this this regulation is in beta, please <laughs> submit comments. Oh, so many problems. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I don't know if that caused any trouble for the, the submission system that Fight for the Future set up, but that was another avenue to do it. Um, Coin Center probably had, <laughs> yeah, Coin Center probably had one of the most interesting takes Um of the bunch because as of yesterday, January 7th, which was the final day um, to submit comments, Peter Van Valkenburg wrote uh, that they had submitted a new comment, which I will read the majority of because it is great. Here we go. Upon further review conducted through the meager period of time allowed within this rushed rulemaking process, we believe that the Treasury Department does not have the statutory authority to promulgate this regulation. To quickly review administrative law, the Treasury Department, as a division of the executive branch, is not constitutionally empowered to make laws. We sometimes call the rules that are made by executive agencies laws, but they are not laws. They are rules that support and implement the laws that are actually passed by Congress. So, for example, this proposed rule, if it were to be finalized, would become part of the pages of regulations that implement the policies articulated in the Bank Secrecy Act, a law passed by Congress in the 1970s and subsequently amended several times. It is the Bank Secrecy Act that is the actual law, and while that law does afford the Treasury some power to fill gaps in precisely how they enforce that law, it does not give them carte blanche uh, to do whatever they see fit to stop money laundering. As we detail in our second comment, we believe it also doesn't give them the authority to subject cryptocurrency exchanges to extraordinary reporting and record-keeping obligations, as the midnight rulemaking seeks to do. The problem we've identified with this new rulemaking is that it seems to be justified by a parathetical statement in the text of the BSA itself, uh, rather than being justified by an actual delegation of power from Congress to the Secretary. It might also be justified by the Secretary's general powers under the BSA, but to the extent that's all that under GERDs, it's, I've actually, under GRIDs, under GERDs, it's authority, that would suggest that the Treasury is assuming too much about those general powers. If those powers are not limited by some actual principle in the text of the Bank Secrecy Act itself, then they are legislative powers, and again, the executive is not allowed to legislate under our separation of powers and constitutional structures. End of reading that. So, yeah, what a surprise. Um, some executives in this administration are overstepping and abusing their authority? Who would have guessed? Certainly Fuck not you, me. Chin. Oompa loompa doopity doo. I really love how that came about too, because if I remember right, the only reason they started digging into that is because somebody was yelling on Twitter that the National Defense Authorization Act was um, bad for crypto and found all of this digging through that to, to check that assertion. Yeah, can I, can I also point out how, like, how, what's the right word, how punk it was for Jerry Brito to be like, 
hey guys, if we submit enough comments before the before the deadline, there'll be so many comments they won't be able to properly read them, and that means they can't do anything about this. That like that is the lawyer way of saying DDoS. <laughs> DDoS this proposal. <laughs> You know what that actually reminds me of? Um, Jim Bell's uh, idea of DDoSing the court system for nonviolent crimes. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> but completely legally. <laughs> and that, my friends, is the game that I played for New Year's instead of guns or fireworks. Here, here, Union. And did, didn't one other um, group of douchebags actually go, this is a bad idea? Uh, besides chain analysis? But wasn't there another chain analytics company, or was it just chain analysis? I did not see any. It's possible there might have been, but to be honest, I was even surprised to find one because. Like that, see, that tells you how bad this is because as much as blockchain surveillance companies like to say they care about privacy, every time there's a new rule or regulation that comes out that ruins privacy for us, they are usually completely silent or they are cheerleading the fuck out of it. So I was even surprised to find Chainalysis saying this is a bit much. <laughs> like that tells you how bad it is if the chain analysis company is like, hmm. I don't know. This is a bit much. Don't do this. You know, I completely forget who said this, but I saw somebody on Twitter um, say that it's probably just them worried that the government will collect so much information um, that they will be able to do chain analytics better than the chain analytics companies. <laughs> so they're pretty much just worried about being obsoleted. That That definitely makes sense. Yeah. Like, wasn't what what was the thing that we read in one of the last couple episodes? I can't was it FinCEN? There 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 was a report where it kind of like it kind of like throw uh threw shade on blockchain surveillance not really being effective enough or something. I can't remember what it was. I actually no, it might actually be this rulemaking. I th I I it's been so long since I read it, but I think that might I think that was yeah, cuz if you read through Chain Analysis's response, they kind of address that and I think that might have triggered them <laughs> into responding. <laughs> oh, this that is so great. still not working today. It it was quite a long document, but I think that was that was the reason that I looked to to see whether they made a comment because I was like, ooh, did they <laughs> did they get mad? Well, I mean, it makes sense. Like you know, if chain analysis is going to be a thing, uh, the government is the one in the best position to hoover up metadata for that, and companies doing that right now aren't going to like that. And, and see, the funny thing is that, like, uh, in their response, Chainalysis says, oh, you don't have to worry about unhosted wallets because they're not even a large percentage of, of the transaction volume, um, which that's kind of like a self-dunk because they're saying, oh, the majority of the transaction volume doesn't even use, like, non-custodial KYC-free wallets, and yet, <laughs> and, and yet we're not good enough for you. Oops! <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm laughing so hard right now at all of this. I can barely talk. Well, it's gonna be a fun shit show this year. <laughs> but it's like it's funny that like, uh, I, I mean, to summarize this Coin Center post, it's like, where is your authority? I don't think it's there. Ah, oh, boy, fucking Finson. And what is some of the consequence of uh, U.S. regulations showing itself? Well, thus begins a giant block of shinobi stories that I could not break up. 
So um, Bittrex and Bittrex Global are going to be delisting Dash, Zcash, Monero, and Grin on January 15th. And from that point, all markets will shut down and they will give users a 30 day window to withdraw any of those coins that were not sold um, or disposed of. And um, no more privacy coins on Bittrex. Um, and honestly, this shouldn't be a surprise. It's kind of been for the last year or two in different jurisdictions, exchanges are delisting um, these privacy coins. And um, yeah, the funniest thing um, out of all of this, and I actually need to find this and put this in the show notes so people can laugh at it. I think um, I know what you're talking about. I have it. All of the Dash people um, screaming and losing their minds and trying to argue how they're not privacy coin um, because it's opt-in privacy and not default like something like Monero. So why the hell are they getting delisted? Because like it, it's not privacy by default. We're not a privacy coin <laughs> despite that being like half of their fucking marketing like shtick for the last couple of years. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'm going to quote from the tweet that came from the Dash Pay Twitter account, which is like the, the biggest Dash account, and it says, From a technical standpoint, <laughs> Dash's privacy functionality is no greater than Bitcoin's, making the label of privacy coin a misnomer for Dash. We have reached out to Bittrex to request a meeting with their compliance team. Hopefully this will be rectified soon. <laughs> Oh my god. The hilariousness is just mind boggling. Like it <laughs> So Dash Dash, I have a qu I have a question for you. So the fact that you're going to have a meeting with the compliance team, does that mean <laughs> that um your status as a decentralized coin is also a misnomer? <laughs> I would say so. I mean, what kind of coin can go negotiate with an exchange? Oh, this is so great. Because, like, the number, I mean, I've, thankfully, I've never encountered a person where I've had to argue about Dash being a privacy coin. Um, but I'll just show them this next time. <laughs> It's just so funny too, though. Like the, one of the first things they did was do coin joins coordinated by their master nodes. Like, <laughs> like the the two things everybody shills that coin for are cheap payments and privacy. <laughs> you know what's even weirder? Um... So the there's a bunch of screenshotted tweets that Fluffy Pony, of course, tweeted out, and one of them is a tweet from February 2020, so a year ago, and it says, This week at Dash Core Group made a few private send changes to improve privacy. So, like, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just bizarre. I mean... I mean, for anyone who doesn't know the details of how terrible Dash is at privacy, um, Aaron Furdum wrote an article about this uh, in 2019 or something. He did like a series of um, articles about like, hey, this privacy coin is actually not very private. And Dash was one of them. Uh, so check that out if you're not clued into the details. But yeah, private send is uh, not that effective. Who would have thought shitcoin devs do bad job at implementing privacy tech? I I also I don't know is the word rectified. <laughs> I mean, uh, never mind. I just that image. It's like you know they're <laughs> spreading their cheeks, aren't they? Sorry, is your butt sore? Oh, we right. will rectify the situation soon by uh, bending the knee. Ah, oh, man, some good laughs today. Good laughs. Alrighty. So, 
this I'm just going to blurb quick style um, and then move along. But uh, brains, um, the, what would you call it? Uh, company that forked off um, from Satoshi Labs long, long ago um, and has been managing slush pool has finally acquired, I believe, in October, the last um, outstanding shares um, held by Satoshi's lab for Slush Pool. So despite the fact they have been operating it exclusively for years now, um, they now wholly own Slush Pool. And there is a complete clear divide between Brains, <clears throat> which is going to continue working on um, you know, their mining firmware and pool operations um, and Satoshi's lab, which has developed uh, the Trezor and maintained that over the years. So, uh, yeah, quick little update there. And I think in the end, um, it's always a good thing to separate entities that are working on wholly different things, even if there is a big uh, people overlap there. So, huzzah. Mm-hmm. Let's get more people using that firmware and running Stratum version 2 with uh, better hash support. In other news in the mining world, that stupid block seer pool that is going to be OFAC compliant. Woo! Um, now has the Marathon Patent Group. Um, entering into an arrangement um, to start mining at Bloxier. And the uh, the TLDR of this is kind of interesting. Um, so they're pretty much just a old um, patent trolling company <laughs> um, that is jumping into the mining space. Um, we um, claiming that they control 7.6 of uh or percent of the total bitcoin network hash rate um i am kind of skeptical of that because in this announcement um <clears throat> they've also um entered into an arrangement with bitmain as of december 28th or around there um the end of last year to purchase 70,000 S19s um, from Bitmain, um, some of which they will receive in July of 2021, with the final shipment occurring in December of 2021. Um, so I'm not aware of any actual um, you know, evidence of them operating um, hardware right this moment <clears throat> um so i think they're kind of playing games here um maybe even potentially trying to pump their share price as um you know based on everything i can find um they have bought miners um they have an agreement with bitmain but none of them are going to show up until halfway through this year and it's going to take until the end of this year to actually receive all of the equipment and get it up online running. So um, while fuck this company um, <laughs> for getting on board with the Bloxier pool, but who really knows how much of the uh, overall network hash rate that will actually be at the end of this year um, with everybody else bringing new hardware online, um, new operations starting. So. Um, yeah, hopefully a lot of competitors will get up and running first, and it'll be a lot less than that 7% that uh, Marathon is operating. But um, yeah, kind of makes sense to me that a greasy patent troll company <laughs> um, is trying to get involved with the Bloxier pool, um, which plans on lobbying and probably trying to regulatorily capture mining in, in America and North America to their benefit so uh yeah that 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 just makes perfect sense to me yeah i mean uh you know there's there's been so much uh influx of 
businesses doing mining stuff in the U.S. recently when there hadn't really been very much before outside of individuals. So I feel like this is just like, I don't know, slapping a good thing in the face <laughs> that they're now pushing, they're going to push it back out if this is successful. So they're stupid. Yep. Like the, the uh, effect of you making mining harder to do in the u.s is that it's all just gonna move back out it's like you're not gonna fix anything in your convoluted little world of kyc everyone well hopefully all of this plays itself out the incentives work properly at scale and all of this winds up floundering yep speaking of incentives though um so, Ruben Samsung has dropped a new potential design for a sidechain. This motherfucker needs to stop having so many damn ideas all the time. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So, he last year came up with the idea for a one-way... Um, pegged sidechain that would use uh, effectively a bunch of um, L2 transactions that would allow that transaction to commit to sidechain blocks. And because it is a single transaction, guarantee that only one block can be committed to. But, um, you know, it's kind of a one way um, you burn your coins into the sidechain and they can never come out again. Um, he's now proposing this idea for <clears throat> what he's referring to as a soft chain that would use proof of work, um, fraud proofs. And pretty much, um, the idea here would be to have a, um, side chain in which you use, um, UTXO set commitments. So something like UTXO. And the idea is that whenever there is a fork of the side chain, um, <clears throat> you would um, kind of download the conflicting blocks in the fork and use that to analyze if anything is being violated in terms of consensus rules. And with the UTXO set commitment, um, have some degree to actually guarantee the entire UTXO set, not just the transactions in the block, and um, kind of download these whole blocks from the sidechain um, to validate that. And this would be something that main chain full nodes would have to do. So the idea is by default, they're downloading all the block headers for the sidechain. In the event of any um, fork, they would download the actual blocks in that fork and make sure that things are correct um, consensus wise, validating the blocks and the uh, UTXO commitments. And um, his math looking at um, 11 stale or invalid blocks on the main chain in the last four months kind of extrapolates that if that held true, um, you would only be downloading an extra around 100 megabytes um, per side chain per year as a main chain node. And the idea is that, um, you know, you can kind of, th th this would be kind of a dynamic thing where depending on how often the side chain forked, um, you know, you would have to correspondingly download more data the more often that happened. And you could kind of just <clears throat> wait for more confirmations on the side chain, um, depending on what the hash rate there was. Um, so, you know, let's say you want to assume that only 1% of miners on the side chain are honest. Well, then you would wait you know, say instead of six confirmations, 600 on the side chain, because one honest or 1% of honest miners 
would be able to show malicious things eventually, um, which would be verified um, with this proof of work fraud proof system. Um, <clears throat> and you could also kind of address that issue by just merge mining the side chain so that it would be the entire Bitcoin network um, providing work there. Now, um, that is kind of just right off the bat for me, a deal breaker, um, given that this would be multiplied for every individual side chain using this that you activate or activated and like pretty much, you know, playing forking games on a side chain would actually increase the operational costs of a main chain node because the entire idea here is, um, you know, you're actually validating to some degree what's going on in the side chain so that you could design an op code um, that would allow that to peg into a side chain and then peg out with a long delay. Um, I am just not okay with that um, at all because, you know, the, the whole, if you're going to do a side chain, this needs to completely segregate from the main chain and not increase the costs of verifying the main chain. And just with how this works and how dynamic it is, like those costs could get way bigger depending on how that side chain is secured than the 100 extra megabytes per year that Ruben <clears throat> kind of um, mathed out for an optimistic case. And I do wanna say to his credit, um, there is an entire section on his write-up about how a lot of this design could pretty much create um, security issues or problems, and that might just make the idea a non-starter. But he still wants to explore the idea, and, you know, yeah. Um, I just don't like when things increase validating costs of the main chain. And honestly, I would much prefer... Um, his design from last year with federated pegs versus something like this, because at least that system would allow for some kind of two-way peg and not increase the validating cost of a main chain node. But like, seriously, this guy, I cannot think of anybody who keeps coming up with more second layer protocol designs than fucking Ruben at this point. Like it, it's starting to get absurd. Like, he, he needs his own book of second layer proposals that are just his. Forks and chains my, may break my brains, but words can never hurt me. Alrighty. I need to take a, a minute here and zen myself, because I'm going to just repeat things I've been yelling about for fucking years at this point. I have no idea what Zen Shinobi looks like. I've never seen him. Very high. But aren't aren't you usually that most of the time? <laughs> no, just regular high. Okay. So, um, this has kind of been off my radar for a little bit um, because Paul Stork likes to block people who call him out on misrepresenting things um, and just hiding in his own little corner um, from all forms of criticism. But apparently drive chain um, is still, you know, undergoing development and being shilled around all the place in the little bubble where all criticism is magically erased. Um, and they've recently just dropped um, version 36 of the actual implementations um, with a Zcash um, side chain using the drive chain design. And this entire design is broken for multiple reasons, which I am going to calmly iterate again and then close the book on this. First off, Paul has for years continued to make the claim that to activate drive chains, all you have to do is have the miners 
enforcing the consensus rules that would lock Bitcoins into a drive chain. That is wrong. That is an outright lie. And that is wildly unsafe. The entire model of a drive chain is that every node would be validating the peg ins and outs from the drive chain. And that if miners attempted to steal things or play games, people could just do a UASF to take the coins back. Um, that I think is completely delusional at global scale, but that's not the point I'm trying to make. If only miners are enforcing those pegs and economic nodes are not, businesses nodes, users nodes are not, then there is absolutely no delay on withdrawing coins from a drive chain. The minute a majority of miners decide they're going to steal coins from a drive chain in a situation where only miners are enforcing those consensus rules, it happens in one block because none of the economic nodes, none of the user nodes are enforcing those extra rules for coins locked in a drive chain. So one block, they're all gone and every other node on the network besides the minority of miners will look at that and go, that's valid. So the entire statement of security model that um, Paul continues to push, we just need the miners, because he is so insistent and rabid to get this activated is wrong. It is a lie and it is completely unsafe to activate something like this with only miners enforcing the rules. Completely unsafe. As well, he continues to make the claim that this creates no centralization pressures for miners. Because the main chain is the only thing validated with the extra rules for pegging in and out. And that's all miners are validating. That there is a, a separate node without miners actually constructing the blocks, taking some fees for themselves, and giving fees to the miners to actually include the drive chain block in the commitment of the main chain. That is also incorrect. Mining is an entire system that is hyper competitive and pretty much designed to drive the revenue to the cost of mining. The profit margins will inherently get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until they are razor thin. And every one of these non mining nodes in the drive chain design that are keeping a bunch of fees before they give some to the miners to make that block valid, that's extra money that miners will not be getting. And when their margins get thin enough, miners will just have to start running those nodes themselves to get that extra money to be more competitive. And eventually when mining margins get to that thin point, that will happen. And yes, even drive chains will add centralization pressure to mining. And that is completely disingenuous to claim that is not the case. So like final point, drive chains are an idiotic design. They are not safe in a number of situations. They present long-term centralization dangers for Bitcoin. And the person who came up with this design regularly and consistently lies about these things. This is a horrible idea, and this should not be forked into Bitcoin. I literally think I'm going to just cut that out now into its own audio clip, and I'm just going to play that at people whenever drive chains come up. Okay. Alrighty. So are we ready to talk about hardware wallets? Sure. So Blockstream just uh, released, I think, on the 3rd. Yeah, why, I have to think about that. On Bitcoin's birthday, um, the Blockstream Jade hardware wallet. 
And um, let's just say this is not something I am running out to grab and put my cold storage on, but I think this could potentially be a useful device in this ecosystem, especially given the fact that it's only $40. So really compared to almost everything else out there, this is really fucking cheap. But that said, um, there is no secure element or any kind of physical security um, for the most part. And the underlying hardware is, is pretty much just the M5 stack, um, a little DIY hobbyist device. Um, people have built um, their own custom hardware wallets out, or out of it. I believe one of them was the Bowser wallet. Um, it just had like a little 8-bit video game and you could like get past that um, and then actually open up a wallet. Um, people have built um, open dime verifiers out of it. I think there's even a, a lightning network um, point of sale device that has been built out of this. But, um, you know, their kind of thinking behind doing this is that ultimately this is a very widely sold device for a lot of different purposes. And if somebody really wants to, um, like all the firmware that they're running on the device they sell, which is the same hardware, um, should work on the M5 stack fire. So you can effectively buy your own version of this device um, with a lot less supply chain risk to consider because it's not something sold specifically for Bitcoin and actually flash their firmware on it. Um, and another interesting thing about this is um, because there is no um, secure element on this, um, and I'm not entirely sure at a low level exactly how this works, but um, the way it was described in a Reddit AMA about the Jade is effectively to decrypt your keys. Um, this device actually connects to a backend server that Blockstream runs, and they're going to open source it if it's not already so that people can run their own. But the idea is, you pretty much do a handshake with this server and then create a um, split secret, I believe, between the actual Jade device and the server. So when you plug the wallet in to use it um, and enter your pin to decrypt your key, um, from my understanding, that key is actually stored, encrypted on the device and requires um, you know, an action from the server that Blockstream runs to actually decrypt it. And the backend server will enforce a three pin try. And as long as um, your device hasn't been tampered with, um, if you fail the pin entry three times, the backend server will delete what's needed to decrypt the seed. And so will the um, Jade device itself if it hasn't been tampered with. And at that point, you need to do a mnemonic recovery. But the idea. Um, thinking here, uh, I'm assuming, is the, the backend server effectively kind of functions like a virtual secure element. So something that can't really be tampered with on your device um, that acts as a safeguard for the keys. And like, honestly, I think that's an interesting design and a way to get around that. But I also think that that's going to probably be kind of a, a headache in terms of um, non-Blockstream software um, integrating support for this because it's going to require um, either plugging into Blockstream's backend to use that or spinning up your own um, instance of this backend server that fulfills that function. So... You know, I think for the time being, um, I would assume it's going to be a while before this works with anything except Blockstream Green. Um, but um, yeah, um, it also has um, a Bluetooth antenna, um, which is part of the the default design of the M5 stack. Um, but there is a uh. there is a firmware variant um, that does not come with the drivers for that, so that it won't function. 
Um, and there's also a camera in the back of the device, um, which they plan on building out firmware support for so that people can do um, camera PSBT exchanged. Although I, I am kind of wondering how that works given that you need to connect to the server to actually decrypt the key. Um, so um, yeah, that, that is an open question. Um, I haven't been able to find an answer to. Block screen webcam. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, like I said, um, I personally would not use this at all um, for a, a main cold storage wallet or anything like that. But it does have liquid support. So if you're using liquid, um, I think this would be a good setup for that. Um, they are planning on making this work with a uh, general multi-sig. So it might not be a, a bad thing to be a, another signing device in a multi-sig you had set up given the, the low price point. Or if you want to be autistic and have some kind of hardware um, device holding your key for something like a mobile wallet instead of just leaving it on the mobile wallet. Um, I guess you could do that. But um, yeah, overall, I just say that I, don't know, I, I have never seen a security architecture like this really before. And I think it's really unique, but that's also kind of what makes me hesitant to really consider using this for anything but part of a multi-sig or you know like i said um anybody who's actually using liquid or has anything on liquid yep all righty then there is also a new firmware release for the cold card so a lot of um new functionalities for multi-sig support. Um, it will now track um, derivation paths for each individual cosigner in a multi-sig instead of assuming that um, every XPUB is using the same derivation path for the addresses in a wallet. So that should help with, uh, you know, um, come on brain, compatibility. Um, <laughs> between anything um, using weird derivation paths for stuff. Um, it will now block um, using the same XPUB twice in a multi-sig. Um, that's good because that's really dumb. Um, why are you doing a multi-sig if you are reusing the same keys multiple times in it? That doesn't really make any sense. Um, It'll show Y and Z pub um, values when looking at multi-sig wallet details. Um, it will actually um, maintain and track now the address type um, from any multi-sig wallet that's created by pulling in a PS PSBT file. Um, it is, for some reason, um, was using the pay to script hash, pay to witness script hash um, kind of label um, backwards. So that has been flipped around um, and that you should keep in mind might cause issues um, between different cold cards on different firmware versions after that. Um, it's also um, store or capable of storing multiple wallets that use the same XPUBs between um, the um, different wallets or if they're using different address formats or key paths. And um, also, don't ever turn this on unless you know what you're doing, but um, there is a mode which disables a lot of the multi-sig safety checks um, so that people can kind of look for uh, bugs with compatibility issues. Um, so that is a nice thing for developers to tinker around with. And then in general, um, they have added support for signing pay join PSBTs um, based on BIP78. Um, moved the address explorer to actually see your receive addresses on the device into the main menu. Um, hat tip Matt O'Dell, who is apparently the one um, harassing him for that. Um, they've moved the um, 
blockchain function to switch between mainnet and testnet into the danger zone section and added a warning screen, um, which is what they said they would do um, when uh, Marco Benkin, um kind of pointed out that uh, the same type of different coin, um, but using the same key attacks that a lot of other wallets were vulnerable to was also something that could uh, be done with testnet versus mainnet. Um, and Rodolfo did not want to remove the testnet functionality entirely because that's kind of very important for devs to tinker around and um, make sure things working properly. Um, it's also fingerprinting any files um, loaded onto the micro SD card. Um, Cause I think right now what it does is it just zeros out the time and date of the file creation. Um, now it's actually going to use a unique date and time based on the firmware version on the device. And uh, the thinking here is, you know, if you take that um, file and plug it into um, a software wallet to broadcast or something, or you know, load a wallet file, um, the actual software wallets can kind of track and be like, hey, like you're behind on your firmware, like you are vulnerable to like this bug or issue, so that uh, people are more aware of when they need to update the firmware. Um, and I kind of want to shiv him for this. Um, mm, the paper wallet generation um, feature has been removed to make space for stuff. Although he says that they are planning on bringing it back soon. Um, we, I have to go yell at Rodolfo now because he's going to have to uh, do work anyway to put it back in um, and yell at him again to not include the private key in the text file or um, image that that exports and just show it on the screen so that you can write that down manually and um you know just write that down on the image file that way people can actually safely just print a paper wallet but guarantee in an idiot proof way that the private key never touched a network or computer or printer because they're just gonna actually write that down after they uh you know print it out so yep a uh, pretty major release and um, a lot of nice changes overall, a lot of nice changes to make multisig work better. Mm -hmm. Alrighty then. So are we ready to move on to the best day of my life in the last two years? Indeed we are. So in case anyone here has been living under a rock, it is my pleasure to inform you that the judge in the extradition case of Julian Assange in the UK ruled that he should not be extradited. This was on January 4th, the day after Bitcoin's birthday, so two great events happening right next to each other. Um, and I'm going to, the judgment was published right after the decision, so you can read the entire argument that Judge Britzer made, but I'm going to read the summary from defend.wikileaks.org, which the Courage Foundation, I think, is mostly managing, um, because it's a good summary. The, 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 the judgment document is very long. Um, but they say, in, the uh, in a ruling in which she accepted nearly every argument from the U.S. government, Judge Vanessa Baritzer agreed with the defense's claims that the U.S. prison conditions Assange would face if he were extradited, including solitary confinement, special administrative measures, and extreme restrictions at ADX Florence would drive Assange to suicide. She ruled it would therefore be unjust to extradite Assange to the U.S. and ordered his release. And I specifically want to point out that the detail about him... Being, him being driven to suicide by U.S. prison conditions, it was uh, specifically cited in the document um, that because uh, the U.S. government was unable to prevent Jeffrey Epstein from committing suicide, uh, how could they prevent Assange from doing so? And that the reason Assange would be able to uh, is because also she recognized that he has been diagnosed with Asperger's and 
So he would have a single-minded determination, I believe were the words she used. So yeah, um, Jeffrey Epstein was in the judgment. Like, no one expected that because the defense didn't bring up Jeffrey Epstein, the prosecution didn't, so this is something that the judge came up with herself. Um, there's a little theory that I'll get into later about... Uh, yeah, yeah, some weirdness there. Anyway, um, yeah, so she ruled it would therefore be unjust to extradite Assange to the U.S. and ordered his release. Key word there, ordered his release. She said that he should be discharged. Um... The U.S., of course, can appeal to the, 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 I'm losing my voice, the decision. Judge Britzer summarized her lengthy opinion and the arguments at issue sided with the prosecution at virtually every step, upholding dangerous arguments that would undermine the First Amendment protections of a free press. And the judge ruled, and I'm going to read off the list of things that she, uh, the conclusions that she came to. So is she saying that she thinks Assange would be murdered? I'll get to that, Shinobi. Um, but so, the so this is basically her responding to a bunch of arguments that the defense made. Um, and so first, she said the UK extradition act should take precedent over the US UK extradition treaty, and the former removed the clause bearing extradition for political offenses. So all of the talk about how people should not be extradited for political offenses, and by political offenses that can be a range of things, uh, and that has generally been upheld in a lot of Western countries that you should not be extraditing people for political offenses. She basically just said here that uh, even though the UK-US treaty bars that the former one doesn't in general and that has more power than the treaty with the u.s specifically even though this is clearly a u.s extradition case uh so she's just saying let's ignore the u.s uk extradition treaty because the the broader one doesn't protect that that is going to be very bad um, she then says the charges and again this is a summary this is not exact quotes if you want exact quotes so you can read the the judgment, but the charges against Assange in the U.S. would be considered offenses in the U.S. Um, so that that's acknowledging the dual criminality, as in what he is being charged with in the U.S. would also be a crime in the U.K. And very interestingly, um, she actually said that it's possible he could be charged under the Official Secrets Act in the U.K. for his actions, that anything that pertains to the U.K. Um, so that was great. Um, Assange's conduct went beyond that of a journalist in agreeing to help Chelsea Manning crack a password uh, and in telling her that curious eyes never run dry, encouraging her to leak more files. Uh, the second part, again, debatable, um, whether <laughs> that should be considered beyond what a normal journalist would do, because if you have actually talked to any journalist, they will often encourage their sources to give them more information. That is not out of the ordinary, so this is all bad for journalism because it's wrong and it's going to set bad precedent. The part about cracking the password, um, there's there was a whole bunch of technical testimony about that, how... Uh, one, they have no evidence that the password was ever cracked. Two, they actually don't even have evidence that the person in the chat logs pertaining to that conversation is Assange. Like, the government, let me say that again, the government has no evidence that the person in that conversation with Chelsea Manning is even Assange, and they did not even attempt to prove that. It was pointed out that they didn't have evidence for that, and they did not respond. Um, so that is also insane. Um the uh the and specifically on this point I'll also mentioned i don't know if anyone saw but today there was an article two articles in the new york times that um the journalist who uh received the pentagon papers from daniel ellsberg has died and part of uh his death included that a the story of how he received and handled the documents from Daniel Ellsberg way back in 1971 has now been published. He actually gave an interview back in 2015 and said, do not publish this until I'm dead. And well, if you read that, you get the sense that, um, well, it's definitely sounding a lot similar to stuff that WikiLeaks would do. And guess what? The Pentagon 
papers was uh Danny Ellsberg was never prosecuted under the Espionage Act because they the the US government engaged in a bunch of shenanigans. Amazing how similar the cases are. Like just to give a summary, uh the journalist lied to Ellsberg. Uh they had the copies of the Pentagon papers in an apartment that they both had a key to. And the journalist lied to Ellsberg and said he wouldn't make copies because Ellsberg, at at one point, he didn't actually want to give the journalist copies. He wanted to just allow them to read them, but he would retain the documents themselves. And the journalist, while Ellsberg was away, copied all of the documents with his wife. He enlisted his wife to help. His wife knew what they were doing. They copied all the documents, flew on a plane back to uh, the his, the office of the New York Times and and then arrange publishing them like I don't know that that's quite interesting in the context of all of this I would I would want to think about that more um, uh, furthermore from the judgment get back to that the release of the unredacted cables was indiscriminate. Uh, again, there was a bunch of testimony to counter that, and the U.S. government didn't really have any good evidence to back up their assertion that it was indiscriminate. Um, in fact, a lot of the media organizations that said that initially, uh, they are now saying the opposite. Um, defense arguments about Assange's political opinions were extraneous, as in not relevant. There was insufficient evidence that the charges were pressurized by the Trump administration and instead showed healthy internal debate. I think that was an exact quote. Um, there was healthy internal debate about whether <laughs> whether to go after Assange. Uh, though the intelligence community has harshly criticized WikiLeaks, it doesn't speak for the administration. That one was quite hilarious. Um... <laughs> it isn't the UK court's place to comment on the case of UC Global spying on Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy as it doesn't have access to court documents in the case against UC Global in Spain. Yeah. That is, uh, I mean, for, for anyone who doesn't know, the UC Global case is about how the CIA literally partnered with the company that was supposed to be providing security for the Ecuadorian embassy and turned it into a surveillance operation of Assange and his lawyers and doctors and friends. Um, I don't see how that's not relevant and contributed to the fact that, you know, he is not <laughs> very trusting of the ability of the UK government to protect him from the US or the Ecuadorian government. Uh, Assange's perspective jury pool in the Eastern District of Virginia would come from a large county, can't prove it could only be from ex-national security and ex-military officials. Again, completely bogus, like anyone who speaks to uh, any kind of person who's familiar with that area knows that this is wrong. Uh, the I think it was John Kiriakou who he's on video saying that he contact he, he hired the the lawyer who was the lawyer for OJ, of all people, and asked that lawyer to look at his case. And that uh, something about that lawyer was really good and hasn't lost. And that lawyer told John Kariaku that if he was to be tried in the Eastern District of Virginia, like there was no way he was going to win. There was like no chance whatsoever um, because of the location. Um, Challenges of the U.S. prosecution's overbroadness and vagueness should be made in the U.S. court, not adjudicated here. No reason to think Assange wouldn't have constitutional rights when tried in the U.S. This court, uh, specifically they quoted, this court trusts that a U.S. court will properly consider Mr. Assange's constitutional right to free speech. Mm, uh, we can carry on. On whether it would be oppressive to extradite, I accept Professor Kopelman's opinion that Mr. Assange suffers from a recurrent depressive disorder, that Assange has a suicidal ideation and would be single-minded in his attempt to end his life. Potential conditions in a U.S. prison. Um, CIA views Assange as hostile, still a security risk. Assange likely to be sent to ADX Florence would be in a serious isolation. The purpose of special administrative measures is to minimize communications and prisoners have extreme limitations. These conditions were considered by all experts to have de deleterious impact on Assange's mental health. 
Mr. Assange has the intellect and determination to follow through with suicidal ideation. Therefore, I rule it would be unjust to extradite Mr. Mr. Assange. The U.S. has the right to appeal. And then the judge said that he that he should be discharged. Um, and so what happened on January 6th, two days later, is that there was a hearing for the bail application that the defense put forth. Um, and that was unfortunately denied. Uh, the judge literally said it would be unfair given that Assange has a history, uh, as they put it, of... Um, I forgot the word now because my brain is shutting off. I need to eat food. Um, you know, when you run away from detention, what's the word, Shinobi? Do you know it? <laughs> um, escape. Um, it starts with an A. Absconding. Absconding. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So she said that due to his his history of absconding, which, by the way, his history of absconding uh, involves him exercising his right to seek political asylum within the country that he was being prosecuted in. And uh, the judge previously, uh, this this judge, well, no, the judge supervising this judge, saying that his fear over the past 10 years of being uh, extradited to the U.S. was not reasonable, then presiding over the extradition hearing to the U.S., and now saying that it's unfair for the U.S. to, uh, it would be unfair to the U.S. to release him to house arrest during a COVID-19 pandemic to be with his own family. Uh, it would be unfair to the U.S. to release him to those conditions uh, because he might leave, I guess. How exactly yeah. um, does he have a magic rocket ship that bypasses customs? Yeah, I don't know. Also, you know, why, like what you think, you think he's going to leave his partner and children in the UK. You think that he's going to be able to leave the U S in his condition. Like he hasn't proper, he hasn't seen a proper doctor in eight years since he was put under uh, since he entered the Ecuadorian embassy, like they wouldn't allow him to go to a hospital when he had conditions that needed to be addressed. Like, do you think that he's in a condition to leave, not only leave the UK with all the restrictions, but then go to another country with a bunch of restrictions? Like, how do you think he's going to do that? I don't know. I mean, there are ways, but seriously, like not doesn't make sense. That's magical thinking. <sighs> but um yeah so the bail application i mean a lot of the defense's argument center i mean part of their argument was about how hey bell marsh is a maximum security prison he's a he's a non even if he was convicted of what he's been accused of he's a non-violent offender he should not be in a maximum security prison uh, there was some debate about how many prisoners in bell marsh had been confirmed to have coronavirus which I found to be completely pointless in a lot of ways because if you, first of all, if you even have one prisoner in Belmarsh that currently has coronavirus, that isn't, that should be enough because guess what? Your prison is supposed to be isolated. Your prisoners are being isolated right now. If they have coronavirus, that means it's getting in somehow to your prison. Your prison is supposed to not let the wrong people in. If you are failing at that, you have a problem. It doesn't matter how many problems you have, you have a problem. That is enough. Uh, also, the numbers in the prison itself are, in the grand scheme of things, irrelevant because if anyone gets it and anyone, including him, gets it and needs to leave the prison to seek actual medical care, if your country's hospitals are being overwhelmed, how are they going to get adequate medical care if they have to be under constant guard in the hospital just to access that medical care? Do you think they're going to make accommodations for a person like him who's a prisoner? Like... It's insane that these people, I don't know what world they're living in, but they think that the number, the exact number of people with coronavirus in the prison matters. 
Um, Speaking of which, right now, as of an hour ago, Stella Morris, his partner, said, Just heard from Julian, it's freezing in his cell. The hot water pipe system in Belmarsh Prison broke. He says it's getting cold. Um, And it's like negative zero in Celsius. Uh, It's below below zero in Celsius at night there right now. Um, Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know... It's been so cold in Belmarsh that he's been using his books as insulation on the window. Uh, because this prison is a hellhole. And furthermore, I think there were... One second. There was also a tweet from Tristan Kirk. I don't know what this relates to, but he's been following the Assange case, and I think he follows um, just court hearings in general, and he said... Uh, it is unacceptable in terms of huma- humanity. You wouldn't put a dog in conditions like this. And that's a quote from, he says, an experienced uh, queen counsel on the plight of prisoners at HMP Balmarsh held for more than 23 hours in their cell due to COVID, some effectively in solitary confinement. So, yes, Mrs. Judge Lady, so you denied the extradition request on the basis that solitary confinement, that is, I believe the UN defines it as more than 22 hours a day alone in a cell. Um, You define that as too oppressive to his mental health and that it would drive him to suicide and you would not be able to prevent it. And so now you're saying that he's under the same conditions at your own prison and that is not enough to get him out of the prison? To house arrest? Like, what? Well, nobody said the government was consistent. I mean, yeah, it's definitely a good thing that for now he's not getting extradited, but he is nowhere close to out of the woods yet. I just, my uh, screen just froze, but yeah, the other interesting detail that came out um, on the day that the extradition request was denied was that one of the prosecutors you just cut out and janine down janine down i think i just disconnected all right yes you did and you are back what was the last thing you heard the prosecutor okay so one of the did I explain at anything, or is that all I said? Literally just the prosecutor, and then it cut. Okay. Okay, well, this is an interesting thing. So one of the prosecutors on the U.S. team, Trell- Trellinger, uh, made a some kind of statement on the day that the extradition request was denied that, one, he would not be continuing to serve in his role as a prosecutor, um, at least in the current position that he has in the Biden administration. So like, he's not going to be, he's not going to have the same job in like a few weeks. And he also said he didn't think that it was likely that the Biden administration would continue with the prosecution, which is like, what? One, why would he say that? Why would he undermine his own case? And two, uh, is it possible that he's saying that because it's a lie, but he wants to put people off their guard for like the next couple of weeks for whatever reason? Huh. Like, I I just can't, I, I have to assume that there's some kind of ulterior motive to that statement because all of this, like, it, it already seemed too good to be true that the extradition request got denied at this first stage, which... If anyone knows the Lori Love case, um, like, it's unbelievable, but actually Assange is doing better than Lori Love in terms of that, because Lori Love's case, he actually lost at the first level, and then he appealed it, and he won in in one of the appeals. So so how is Assange doing better than Lori Love? That's already amazing. But, like, I can't, I can't. (laughs) <laughs> I just can't believe that a prosecutor would say something that would undermine his own case when it's not technically finished yet. I mean, th- this is just a charade to me. Like, n- none of the shit coming out of these people's mouth is anything but lines in a play. 
But yeah, I mean, it would have been great if on Wednesday it would have been the day that Assange was finally sort of free <laughs> once again after eight years, eight, ten years. Um, but I don't know how much freedom that would have been because he would have been under COVID lockdown if he got out. Uh, so, but still, at the end of the day, January 4th, 2021 was the best day I've had in two years since he was arrested. Yeah, I mean, a win is still a win, even if it's not done yet. Well, I guess we're ready for final thoughts. I will have to go looking for one, because I, that was my final thought. <laughs> I already have one. So, if you don't know who Jello Biafra is, you suck and you're dead to me. He just posted a hilarious meme. You know, you know the muscle Dogecoin and then the little bitch Dogecoin meme? Dead Kennedys, 1980. JFK got domed. Kill all the landlords. America is rotten to the core. Democrats are hopelessly corrupt. Anarchism will free the working class. Dead Kennedys, 2020. I want to give Mitt Romney a big kiss on the mouth. <laughs> you just said a lot of words and I do not understand. <laughs> Punk rock bands are pussies these days. Alright, what, what do you got, Janine? Well, since we are a fan of making fun of security theater, um, I will just quote Glenn Greenwald on January 6th, where he said, How have hundreds of billions upon hundreds of billions of dollars been spent in the name of security since 9-11, along with the deployment of drones and surveillance tech, yet a few hundred protesters can so easily breach the Capitol just waltzing in and taking over? That is a very good question. <laughs> Indubitably. Okay, so Shinobi, do you remember that uh that guy, that NFL player who started uh, using Strike to get part of his paycheck in Bitcoin? Yes, I do, and you also just triggered my mind on something too. Yeah, so did you see that he tweeted at Matt O'Dell and said, "Twitter needs more privacy tweets from you. I need to upgrade my privacy stack." So I would just like to say, this guy gets it, and you all need to upgrade your privacy stack too. Well, I guess that wraps us up for the day. So, our name is Six Semper Tyrannus. We meet under the Brooklyn Bridge at 9 o'clock. The password is Satoshi. See you there, punks. Bye. Free Assange. <laughs> Yeah, you can have foods yet. Yeah, you can have foods yet. Yeah, you can have foods yet.